Today I just wanted to go over our first grouping of organisms. These are all stock cultures that I did a tri-plate to try to conserve uh, on our plate. And so what I want to do is just go through the first grouping with you. I have um, the blood auger plate and the chocolate uh, auger plate uh, with most of these. So let's take a look real quick. So these did come from beads. That's what those are in the background. Okay, so this is my staff plate um, and Micrococcus luteus. So I'm going to flip it over so that you remember what is in where. So um, going back to a previous um, video, you'll remember that I said that that is a very staffy looking gray. That's what I was talking about. It's nice to have all three of these on the same plate because of how similar they are. So if you're thinking of um, staph and micrococcus, they end up going uh, in the same side of the split when you talk about catalase positive versus catalase negative. So um, these are all catalase positive positive, uh, gram positive cocci, okay? Micrococcus is the one right here. It's got that yellowy look to it and it doesn't have as prominent um, of colonies on here as uh, the other two do. Again, um, this is not a full streaking out, okay? So that's uh, that could be a good reason why. And these are stock cultures that I just tried to do so that we could get some growth. So you may not see um, very great colonies here, but here if you can see Staph aureus has um, beta hemolysis, you can see the, the top of the plate actually through the bottom of there. Um, you can see my fingers now. Okay, so that's beta hemolytic. The other ones are not, they're gamma, um, which means they don't have hemolysis. This is Staphylococcus epidermidis. This is on your skin. Staph aureus is all over the place. <laughs> and this is uh, micrococcus. And a lot of times it is actually mistaken um, for staph. And so um, just because coagulase negative staph rather, um, because it is also uh, coagulase negative and they look similar in regard to their cellular morphology. So we look at uh, novobiosin uh, resource, resistance versus sensitivity to help uh, distinguish between those. So that's what we've got there. That's on the blood auger plate. And then on the chocolate auger plate, um, I still have a bead on there. Uh, this is what they look like. So as you can see, micrococcus, I'll put them all in the same spot. Micrococcus is yellow on both, okay, and making sure staph aureus is in the same place. So here's micrococcus, staphylococcus aureus, and staphylococcus epidermidis. They both, um, they all keep their same um, basic color and what they look like. All right, you um, may or may not see some of these beads in there. So let me take an, <clears throat> okay, hold on just a second. Okay, let's move towards the next set. So those are my staphies and micrococcus, and I just wanted to make sure that you could see those. Okay, you're going to be a little confused with this because I do have a lot of Neisseria here. Um, our gram-negative cocci that we deal with in class are our Neisseria and also the Moraxella cotarellis. Moraxella Moraxella cotarellis is um, the only Moraxella species that can be a gram-negative cocci. The rest are like cocobacilli and um, rods. So <clears throat> that's why we have that in this uh, grouping as well. Okay, so we have uh, Neisseria meningitidis, we have Neisseria lactamica, and Moraxella cotarellis. So I'm going to flip them over. The reason I have um, a few plates of the same thing is because I was concerned I didn't have, I wasn't going to have enough for students to do their biochemicals to um, this week, so I wanted to get as many as possible. So here we notice that Neisseria looks really, really tiny um, and doesn't really have a definitive color, whereas Mox Moroxella does. It looks kind of, Moroxella looks very staffy in regard to that gray, um, but um, we're just going to take a closer look here. Um, again, the, the gram uh, stain would be gram-negative cocci, and Neisseria likes to be in pairs. Okay. 
Okay, so that's what they look like on both plates. Um, I'm gonna pause just for a minute, take a picture. Okay, and then this was the extra plate that I did, and this is Niceria on chocolate. Um, so on the left here is Niceria meningitidis, and on the right is Niceria lactamica, okay? Now, as you may have guessed with um, the species name meningitidis, Neisseria meningitidis does cause uh, meningitis in young adults. So if you see this in a CSF, this one on the left, um, then that's what you're thinking. So maybe um, it could be even like college students, um, <clears throat> whereas uh, we'll see organisms that give babies and uh, elderly um, and children meningitis. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next group. The next group does have those organisms in it. Um, so here I have the, <clears throat> the strap, the strap plates. Um, I'm going to have a couple of those actually. So these are not all the straps that we have in class. And you can see that I tried to put the um, alpha hemolytic ones on the same one, okay? So um, pneumonia is on the left, Midas is on the right, and Bophus is on the bottom. Okay, so again, oh shoot, pneumonia is on the right. Okay, so you can see the greening. I have that really great smell coming out right now. Um, there's a greening of the colonies and that's alpha hemolysis. Um, this should be a chocolate. Uh, it's hard to tell the difference right now with how my camera's picking up the light. This is the chocolate, this is the blood. Um, when you're testing these, you may not always have a primary setup that includes a chocolate, but I wanted to show you what they look like. So Streptococcus pneumoniae is going to be uh, right here on the right. Um, that is the one that is susceptible to Uptichin. And we also want, so the P-disc um, or OP, depending on the manufacturer, and the um, uh the menin, this is the organism that causes meningitis in uh, young children, you know, and they're um, like one, two, three, four, five years of age, and um, also the elderly. Babies, on the other hand, are going to have meningitis caused by a different one. Of course, I'm not going to say all of the, um, all of the cases or the, uh, disease states that you can get from these because this would just be an extremely long video. Okay, so this is just um, this is just the alpha hemolytic uh, streptococcus right there. So that's um, streptococcus is catalase negative. Okay, um, and it's gram positive cocci in pairs and chains. I forgot to say staph. Staph is. Um, going to be pairs, tetrads, and clusters. Staph aureus has grape-like clusters and everything else just has clusters. Okay, and staph aureus is the only one that's not, let me give you a visual. Staph aureus is also the one that is coagulase, um, coagulase positive and the staphylococcus epidermidis and everything else is going to be coagulase negative. Okay, those are virulence factors. Okay, so now we're moving on to the other straps and uh, should be enter, yep, enterococcus on the bottom too. Okay, enterococcus can honestly be any kind of hemolysis. It can be beta, it can be alpha, it can be gamma. Um, so ours ends up, for enterococcus faecalis, um, ours ends up being mostly alpha. Um, but that may change depending on what strain um, you use in whatever program you're in. Okay, so again, we have this on blood here and chocolate. If you'll notice, we have beta hemolytic streptococcus pyogenes. My marker was really thick, so I then changed to a different one to write the names. Um, so you can see that beta through there, the streptococcus agalactiae. Um, that one is supposed to be beta hemolytic, but when we look at this here, it's looking alpha, okay? Um, 
I'm going to show you a flow chart in a minute that we use in class uh, to show you the kinds of testing that we do. So again, I'm going to flip this now. So let's see, pyogenes. Okay, pyogenes is going to end up on the left. Again, we have all those beads. Okay, this one's dying. It got cold. Um, so the crystallization is because the refrigerator apparently got extremely cold and that's kind of icy. So this is, I guess, a bad picture. Um, but <clears throat> on the right, you can see it on the chocolate. Okay, so staph pyogeny, or sorry, streptococcus pyogenes is right here. Then we have streptococcus agalactiae and enterococcus faecalis. Enterococcus faecalis is in your gut. Um, and is normal flora there, but it can be a pathogen in other places, as we talked about before. Um, strep A galactiae on the right here is what's going to cause meningitis in um, babies. And that's because it can be um, in the mother's um, in the mother's normal flora um, down in the location where she's going to give birth. And so um, when the baby passes through the birth canal, there can be an exchange of a lot of blood and organisms, and the baby can contract the Staphylococcus A. galactiae there. It's also known as group, group B strep um, and can end up with meningitis. And um, Streptococcus pyogenes, which is the beta hemolytic here, um, even though Agalactiae should be beta hemolytic as well. Let's see. No, it still looks alpha. Um, <clears throat> so that is what causes strep throat. Um, it also causes a slew of other things. Um, it can be um, the scarlet fever if you don't catch... Um, the strep throat immediately and that would be noted by a big rash and the tongue being extremely red um, and it can go systemic and um, and become um, the patient can become septicemic as well so um, that's something you don't play with and you know mothers and uh, fathers and everyone um, that are in charge of children make sure that when the child has strep throat you do need to get them antibiotics you should not just let their body try to fight it because it will go systemic and it can kill the child eventually so um, you're you're playing with fire when you do that um, and uh, so just make sure you can get the child antibiotics um, as soon as possible and we do a rapid strep test in class um, I want to show you this um, this is contamination here when I was um, when I was doing the stock cultures, there was a bead that ended up flying into, <laughs> flying into this section. And so that's why you see that differentiation there of the um, different kinds of colonies. Um, so anyway, uh, we do do rapid strep in here, um, that test where you take the throat swab uh, from the tonsils and uh, you put it in the extraction fluid and then um, the strep A um, antigen is going to be um, identified and um, cause a positive result. So we'll do that then in class as well. Okay, so this is what they look like. Enter oh, Enterococcus ends up being um, same thing. It's gram-positive cocci and pairs and chains, but it looks like it's much bigger. Um, at least ours does. It looks much bigger than the streptococcus uh, cells. And so they kind of look like um, just really gigantic strep. Um, so that's what I like to tell my students about before we go there. And now we're going to go... Um, with just the chocolate, and we're talking about Haemophilus. Probably should have done this when I did Neisseria. Um, those can be finicky eaters as well as Haemophilus. Haemophilus isn't able to break down the RBC and get the um, nutrients it needs out of the RBC. That's why it has to be on chocolate. Most of them will not grow on um, blood auger plate, except for the one that I have here, the uh, Parahemolyticus should uh, be able to grow on there. I didn't um, <clears throat> I used really old culture beads. Um, they were about three years old, and that's when our system, our um, bead system, doesn't end up um, 
having good recovery with the Haemophilus. So I ended up using last year's batch and just did a tri-plate on just chocolate to make sure that it did grow. Okay, so here are the Haemophilus. All right, on the top, you're gonna have Parahemolyticus, okay? Then um, you're gonna have Influenzae and Parainfluenzae. So on your left is Parainfluenzae. All right, on your right is Influenzae and on the top is Parahemolyticus. There is a huge difference in color and what they look like. Um, obviously, uh, if you have Parahemolyticus, you're gonna have uh, a hemolysin in there, whereas the other two don't. And uh, when you have that, you're going to have a more uh, robust organism it looks like on here. Um, or I could have just done this really, really thick. Okay, so we have nice uh, solid colonies, pure colonies on the left, whereas we don't really have singular colonies too much anywhere else. Again, I wanted to do them thick because I was just trying to give something for my students to work with biochemically. Okay, you can watch another video talking about um, the XMV factor disc that you can put on here to speciate the the difference between the homophilus and um, that's it. So this is the first grouping of organisms. They are gram negative uh, cocobacilli. Okay, so it's kind of hard to tell between them being rods versus being um, cocci. So you have to look very carefully. All right, but that's what our grouping looks like. So here's a review. We have homophilus is going to be your gram negative cocobacilli. Then you've got your Neisseria and your Moraxella catarales are going to be your gram negative cocci. They like to be in pairs. Okay. Then we have our Streptococcus um, and more Streptococcus, lots of Streptococcus and Enterococcus. They like to be their gram positive cocci and catalase negative, uh, and they're in pairs and chains. Okay. And then more strep. Then we have staph and um, staph and micrococcus and those are gram positive cocci that are catalase positive and they are in pairs, tetrads, and clusters. Um, only staph aureus is catalase uh, positive, sorry, coagulase positive and the rest are coagulase negative. And so that would be re represented as CNS, which would be coagulase negative staff. All right. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and I will see you next time. Bye.